What's up, people? I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time. And on top of dedicating this episode to Michael, I would like to dedicate it to my late Zen teacher, Albert Lowe, and two great Catholic theologians that have had a great impact on my life and thinking. Charles Davis from Concordia University and Gregory Baum from McGill. That said, I had the great honor this week to chat with Matt Siegel from the California Institute of Integral Studies on the history of integral philosophy and its relationship to German and British idealism in North America, along with its ongoing impact on various fields of studies and thinkers. Matt is by far one of the most exciting young thinkers and intellectuals to pop out of the California Institute of Integral Studies in the past few decades. It was a real honor for me to connect with him and have this chat. I hope you all enjoy it, and thanks for tuning in. Boom. Here we are. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of your work, so this is, is a great honor for me to, to sit down with you and chat. Um, and I'll start off as well. I mean, to kind of go out and be, um, I have two teachers actually from Montreal to be really happy, uh, to hear me in discussion with somebody on the faculty of CIIS. Hmm. Uh, one, maybe you actually know him. I'm not sure. Um, Albert Lowe, who was my first Zen teacher. Uh, uh, don't know Albert. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, the other one's Gregory Baum, but Gregory Baum, uh, was more associated, I guess, with Thomas Barry. Oh, okay. Um, gotcha. so he probably, I mean, um, Brian swim would probably know for sure. Yeah. Know him and Sean Kelly. Barry's work is alive and well at, at CIIS. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, and, you know, being that I am from Montreal and those people had connections with CIIS, hmm. uh, and how much it meant to them and what they've kind of passed on to me as well. Um, hmm. I mean, CIIS is almost a, a home away from home. <laughs> Oh, for me up in Montreal. Hear. Uh so it's I mean that's that's you know, this is just fun for me to be able to sit with you and talk about that as well. Have you been um, out to San Francisco and visited uh the campus or or you have a love affair with, with CIS through its faculty or what's your relationship to it? Um well I've been to Aslan actually. I oh, actually great. met George nice. Leonard. Uh cool. Yeah. I was hoping to go out and meet the uh, Mike Murphy at the same time, but I went to one of their uh, workshops essentially. Gotcha. So yeah, I've been down three times to California, but not specifically to the campus of CIAS, but the campus isn't much to look at anyway, but, uh, <laughs> you know, Esalen you could say is kind of like the extended campus of CIS. I wish it was even more like literally like that, but, uh, there, there has been a relationship over the years. And I mean, Michael Murphy went to Stanford and then followed one of his professors, Frederick Spiegelberg over to, what was then called the American Academy of Asian Studies, um, the, the the prior institutional incarnation of what is now CIIS. Uh, so Michael Murphy was, you know, one of the earliest students of of this school, and then went on to found the Esalen Institute, and uh, you know continues to carry that work forward. So yeah, there's a deep connection there. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. No, and I guess that's probably my first question to you is, I mean, I know that you're. I don't know if you're Florida, uh, from Florida as a native, but I mean, yeah. how that how you ended up at CIIS? I am a Florida man, um, and ended up at CIIS. Um, it wasn't my first choice for graduate school, actually. Okay. Um, so I studied uh, cognitive science and philosophy and psychology at the University of Central Florida in Orlando and uh, kind of rushed through that. I had a few professors who I'm grateful for, you know, like Sean Gallagher, who's a embodied phenomenologist, um, sort of inheriting Francesco Varela's work and um, really in- introduced me to the phenomenological tra- <clears throat> excuse me, tradition. And, um, you know, but most of my interest, even then as a, you know, 18 to 21 year old was like in consciousness and, um, I was reading Wilbur, I was reading um, Jung, I was reading Alan Watts and Terence McKenna and uh, some of these countercultural figures and really interested in the 60s counterculture and the psychedelic renaissance, you know, the, the first psychedelic renaissance um, back in the 60s. And so I was sort of stewing in all of this and 
got into William Irwin Thompson, got into Jean Gebser. Um, I think, you know, Wilbur really helped introduce me to a lot of important thinkers. Sri Aurobindo also. Um, so I went through Wilbur to these integral thinkers and um, discovered a lot of depth there. But I didn't know that CIIS existed when I um, was first looking for graduate programs. Um, oh, okay, yeah. So I applied to, you know, several different programs. I thought maybe I'd study cognitive science at like a more mainstream university and then um, thought, oh, maybe I want to become a therapist, a counselor, a counseling psychologist. Um, and so I applied to Naropa University, which is this like Buddhist psychology um, school that mostly does, you know, therapeutic training, but also has like the school of disembodied poetry that, that people like Ginsberg and... Uh, Jack Kerouac started, so I was attracted to that, right? But I didn't get into Naropa because I didn't have a, enough practical experience. And uh, I really didn't want to continue in mainstream academia because, you know, you, the only way you're going to get hired to research and teach cognitive science is if you accept the computationalist um, paradigm and consider consciousness to be the function of a machine. Um, that you can decode using information theory and whatever. So I didn't really think that was true and didn't want to create a career around, I thought, pretty shoddy, cardboard, thin ideas. So I eventually pieced together that I had been reading, um, you know, authors like Richard Tarnas and Brian Swim and Thomas Berry and Stanislav Grof and... Um, reading about Rudolf Steiner in books published and edited by um, Robert McDermott and uh, reading about Hegel and Jung and the books of Sean Kelly. And then uh, just Googling, you know, trying to figure out what to do with myself after graduating from college, found this program called Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness at CIIS. And all of these books I had been reading were <laughs> written by the faculty, faculty. <laughs> and they all taught in the same place. <laughs> yeah, And so I was like, okay, <laughs> I think I need to apply to this program, even though it's all the way, literally the furthest, you know, place I could have gone. Um, the opposite coast, San Francisco, super expensive. I don't know anyone out there. It would be a total adventure. And good um, one, it ended up being a very good <laughs> decision, dis decision. So that was 2008 yeah. when I moved out here and, um, uh, yeah, that's sort of my origin story for to at get least to CIS. the journey to the left coast. To gotcha. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, through some of your online chats and other type of stuff, I mean, obviously I heard, you know, obviously that you're from Florida and you did Cockside mm -hmm. there, but I, yeah. I never really kind of got the connection of you know what really dragged you out besides you know some authors and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Well, it was mentioned. not just the program too. It's like the whole mythos of San Francisco because yeah. you know I mentioned I was into the '60s counterculture and like the human potential movement that emerged at that time in San Francisco was just like the, Mecca. the beacon. That's where they set up the lighthouse, you know, for that type of, um, those types of ideas. And so it was like all of this drawing me to San Francisco. It almost seemed too good to be true at first. Like, should I really take a chance on this wild program? That's clearly, you know, on the fringes of academia though, I yeah. think in the last, um, 15 years or so, the world has caught up with what you know the sorts of ideas that are being explored at CIS and in the philosophy program. So it's not as fringe as it as it may have been uh, in the past. But, and your um, story is not that fringe. You know, this is what I mean. That's I mean, you're pretty much almost telling my story. I mean, I didn't go mm. to CIS, but in terms of the literature and you know the individuals and figures that you you know you just you know spoke about i mean those are all figures that had a huge impact on me as well um that you know that i consider that fall, obviously fall into the human potential movement as well or humanistic mm -hmm. psychology and how humanistic psychology branches out into transpersonal psychology um mm -hmm. and i mean we can get into geek out and nerd out about all that that history type stuff but i guess the reason why i launched my pod and what i shared with you briefly is that i mean this is michael's story mm -hmm. You know, this is the same sort of intellectual journey that, you know, that I'm learning that he went through as well, right? I mean, these figures all had a massive impact 
on his on you know on his thinking um, all the way up till he decided to go out and figure out as well in terms of what was going on in terms of college, right? Yeah. I mean, he went into yeah. international relations at that point, and uh, I mean, I'm I, you know I just recently came off a conversation with Josh Summers, and Josh Summers was you know his best buddy, you know, when Michael was like eighteen. You know, and they were talking about all this type of stuff. And uh, they actually met on retreat up at the IMS, the Insight uh, Meditation Society up in the, uh, in Boston, well, well near Boston. Um, and, you know, this confluence, you know, of people that are kind of like, that grew up, you know, on this <laughs> sort of literature, uh, history and culture and stuff like that. And it's come yeah. to impact not only their uh their education but also their their outlook on life um so that's why i reached out to jeremy i mean that's why i reached out to everybody else that you know so far that i've interviewed on the uh, on the pod um but i guess what i'm struggling with and you know i want to do it and talk to you a bit about is um is that this this aspect of michael's life is being forgotten hmm. it's not really coming back to the fore or it's not uh, taken that seriously, I guess, in terms of how it went out and informed his politics. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and why do you think that is? Um, well, I mean, I guess maybe there there are multiple reasons. I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, one is that I mean, once he his his shot to fame is that I mean, he became much more known for his association with Marxist humanism. Sure. Um, but I mean, Marxist humanism is huge. I mean, as a philosophical school type school right. and stuff like that. And people seem to have really gone in and focused in on that aspect of his public persona rather than right. the larger sort of philosophical currents, psychological currents and background education that impacted his thinking and thought. Right. So there's a divide in the left on these questions around <laughs> spirituality and, you know, yeah, very the much. meaning of existence, if it has any beyond a basic humanism you know, and Absolutely. happiness for humans or whatever the goal might be in that more materialist uh, understanding of history and human life. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, the reason why I want to obviously have a conversation with you is that, I mean, you're bridging this gap very well. I mean, mm -hmm. I think in terms of your kind of your academic pedigree and the people that you're talking to, um, and I just have a deep appreciation with how you're going back all the way back into German idealism, right? Mm -hmm. And bringing all that back up to the fore. <laughs> um, and uh, obviously with Whitehead as well. Um, so I guess this is a, a bit of a question to you as well. Is how did you, uh, how are you juggling that at CIIS? Because you're, you're tapping in much more in terms of the Western tradition. Yet CIIS in a certain way is perceived as being much more, or at times, I guess, much more associated with, you know, philosophy from the East or yeah. uh, not taken very seriously, I guess you can say, in terms of its philosophical orientation and, and overall sort of uh, background. Um, yeah, well, I mean, the school originally, again, its prior institutional incarnation, uh, the American Academy of Asian Studies was founded by an American businessman to introduce um, American American investors to Indian culture and, and religion, uh, so that they could, you know, understand the people that they wanted to do business with. And, uh, and so it was a very pragmatic uh, enterprise that drew upon some of the best, you know, Sanskritists and, um, and, um, philosophers uh, of Asian thought um, and, and scholars of Asian thought that were available at the time, and including one of Sri Aurobindo's disciples and, and, and students and a professor of philosophy in his own right, um, Haridas Chowdhury, who was hand-selected by Aurobindo to come over to be the first president of, uh, of the American Academy. Um, and Haridas Chowdhury later was the president of um, CIIS when it changed its name because there was as the school matured beyond, you know, this founding um, impulse by Lewis Gainsborough was his name, this uh, businessman, it, it, it took on a life of its own. And somehow, miraculously, though at times, you know, it was down to a handful of students in Chowdhury's living room, um, this school has survived um, 
since the late fifties when it was founded and it's broadened to become more than just, um, you know, uh, Asian studies, um, school, uh, in Indian and, um, you know, Eastern forms of, of religion and spirituality, but to, to really integrate Western psychology, um, and Western philosophy, though it's true, the philosophy, cosmology and consciousness program is, um, a bit of an outlier in the sense that much of the work, um, done in the rest of the school, um, including, I mean, most of the school is counseling psychology mm -hmm. and is, you know, giving, um, uh, master's degrees in counseling where you go for licensure and become a, you know, a practicing therapist. And so it has more of a vocational bent, but we also have these humanities programs, but, um, in terms of focusing on the Western, what I would call the Western esoteric tradition philosophically and spiritually, um, our program is, um, yeah, unique in that, in that sense that most of the school does turn East and to the, in the, the global South. And all of these are features of our philosophy program too. I mean, we want to certainly incorporate uh, and learn from um, indigenous traditions and uh, you know Asian traditions, and um, not just be myopic in the focus on the West. But you know, the whole thing about the West is it's always been um, a hybrid of of, of everything else. Uh, and so, at the end of the day, um, you know, we're we're trying to be planetary in the way that we do philosophy and, and not, uh, claim like, you know, the right increasingly right wing intellectuals increasingly do that. The West is the best, um, in this sort of narrow, it's just stupid, um, yeah. <laughs> and kind of, um, performs its own refutation in the degree of stupidity required to make comments like that. Um, yeah. instead of recognizing how deeply entangled, um, all of the the world's traditions and peoples have always been like east met west thousands of years ago you know it didn't happen in the 1960s in california right no that was a that was a repetition of a historical pattern where cultural influences you know meet in particularly potent ways and so give rise to these new integral forms of of awareness and consciousness, but it uh, wasn't the first time it happened. Um, so yeah, and, I, mean, I mean, your comments it, true, but the other thing too, though, is that, I mean, when most people, well, I mean, some people might go to and associate it specifically with Alan Watts. Right? Oh, right. He was the first <laughs> Dean of, of the American Academy. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and I mean, that could be a double edged sword, right? That, that could actually go and attract a lot of people to CIAS, uh, or it could possibly go out and turn some people off. But I mean, even yeah. Alan Watts though, as, as a figure, I mean, before he get he got really well known, I guess for you know his his work on on Buddhism and Zen and stuff like that. I mean, he was a, a rigorous theological a thinker. I mean, and, and scholar, Anglican, yeah, yeah. You know, in terms of that a deep, deep Anglican and deeply embedded. I mean, within the Western philosophical and theological traditions, which a lot of people don't appreciate. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I mean, he, you know, he, he also drops Whitehead's name, uh, with a good deal of frequency and, um, you know, and so there's some continuity here in terms of what's been going on, uh, at CIS since yeah. the beginning. I think, you know, we just had a great, we, we, we have Watts is frequently cited in, in dissertations, yeah. um, and, uh, is very much alive among the students who come to, you know, CIS even today. So. Yeah. His and I mean, which, and somebody I didn't really know about that much is uh, Frederick uh, Spiegelberg. I mean, in terms of as a scholar as well, I mean, somebody some, somewhat in the background, I mean, him as well. I mean, he was a direct student, if I understand correctly, of Paul Tillich. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he even studied with, uh, I think it was Otto, I think it was. But either which way, I mean, him as well. I mean, in terms of the, the scholars that have been working you know, at CIS, um, I mean, they've done hugely impactful type work. Um, and uh, what I find, <laughs> I guess it, back to Michael, what I find a bit, uh, you know, like a lot of people go and kind of be dismissive uh, in terms of this sort of countercultural, uh, humanistic, uh, I mean, if you want to call it humanistic psychology or transpersonal psychology mm -hmm. and, yeah. and how that mingled in and out with, I guess, the Western tradition and stuff like that. 
but um, I mean, so, but if I understand correctly, Wilbur was, was a huge influence on you uh, that drew you there. Right? Oh, for sure. I mean, I yeah. didn't know about I, the politics involved, you know, when I started <laughs> reading Wilbur. Um, I learned a bit about that later. I mean, I don't claim to fully understand exactly what went down because I know a lot of the people involved and they don't seem to, it's not like it was, um, there's so many versions of that story, you know, gotcha. why Wilbur and CIS kind of just became um, enemies. I don't think it's that way anymore, but it was just some things he put in print that were, I thought, unfortunate. Um, yeah. And we don't need to get into that, but uh, Wilbur was definitely important for me. Um, I think I started reading him when I was 19. And I think I started with um, uh, The Marriage of Sense and Soul, I think it's called, on Science and Religion. Yeah. And I really Which appreciated it. Yeah, I really appreciated book. that. And then read his first book, Spectrum of Consciousness. And I was like, okay. Cause I, and I knew already when I read it that this was his first stab. Um, and, you know, I had been reading a lot of Jung already, so he was engaging with that. And I was like, okay, this is moving my thinking forward in a, in a really important, significant way. And then I read Sex, Ecology, and Spirituality. Okay. I was like, okay, I'm ready to go deep with this guy. And, yeah. um, you know, the things he says about the ecological movement and feminism. I mean, a lot of this is like, uh, this came out in 95, right? So it's like, if there's any value in a thinker like Peterson, and there's very little, but yeah. it's like, when you compare it to what Wilbur was saying, you know, a generation earlier, it's like, you don't need, like, why would we even pay any attention? Yeah. Um, you know, the need to contextualize feminism historically in the way that Wilbur did, I, and the ecological movement and, um, I appreciated the way he engaged that dialectic uh, in a, at a time when it was probably pretty unpopular to, to do that move. It's more, it seems more obvious nowadays, but, um, and then in, in he, what he says about Schelling in that book really brings out the evolutionary spirit of Schelling's philosophy and German idealism. And so I was like clued into the importance of that moment in the history of philosophy sort of noted that for study later which i had returned to in grad school but um after sex ecology and spirituality when i started to read a lot of his sources like gebser yeah like um more i was reading more varela um and um reading the german idealists and uh looking more closely at some of the postmodernists like Foucault that he was, you know, critical of. And I started to realize that um, his grand synthesis was such that the people he was drawing on might not necessarily agree with how he was interpreting their work. And um, so I, I definitely owe Wilbur a great debt of gratitude for introducing me to all these amazing thinkers at Sri Aurobindo too. Um, but it was like a, a gateway into this wealth of fertile ideas that I thought were way uh, more uh, multifaceted and undetermined than Wilbur's AQUAL at first made it seem. Yeah. Right. So I'm kind of allergic to theories of everything at this point. Not that I don't love like grand cosmological uh, visions, but always with a, um, sort of irony or ability to remain at a distance from one's own vision and recognize that it's not finished or complete or, um, you know, inclusive of everything. There's, there's, that's a dangerous impulse to try to be truly inclusive of everything because then you become just this appropriation monster who's like, you know, grabbing everything in sight and digesting it to turn it into oneself. And you have to be able to, you know, respect the, inexhaustibility of, um, you know, the creativity of the universe. And so, you know, yeah, all that's to say Wilbur, I, I would definitely recommend Wilbur as a way into this whole integral world still, you yeah. know, just no, I mean, and even that, that I mean, like keep going, you know? Yeah. And I mean, that's, it was the amazing thing that I got really, because I mean, in terms of Michael's work, I mean, I wouldn't consider myself a socialist. You know, I consider myself a progressive. So he always fell much more to the left than I was. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I mean, the reason why I got attracted to his work was because of uh, Matt McManus's work on uh, postmodern conservatism. So when he started talking about that and he was talking about Peterson per se, and then all of a sudden that just started to make click for me in terms of, you know, the overall integral model, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're looking at postmodernism, I mean, there should be, you know, a conservative wing to this as much as a left wing. <laughs> you know, and yeah. why aren't we talking about this right wing? And, and if there is a right wing to postmodernism, does it actually go out and provide anything of value? So... Mm -hmm. That's where for me, I mean, it's, it, it just started to click and Michael was talking about it in terms of the new right, right? And he was just giving me a, a full political education once I start to tap into mm -hmm. uh, his stuff. I mean, I didn't study in international relations. My degree is actually in religious studies. Oh, nice. So, you know, so that was my background. But once I saw that connection with Michael, I mean, I just got boom, like, I'm like, so excited. Like, this is wild. Like, he's connecting this and using his international relations background to go out and unpack this and, and use the integral framework to go out and massage this into the culture and, and communicate to people. And that was roughly when I discovered Jeremy's work as well. Uh, and I mean, at that point, I, I started to click. I was like, oh my God, like there's a whole new cohort of people that have been, you know, stewing in this, you know, whether it be integral or some other aspects of, you know, of, of integral theory. I mean, I'm seeing a huge, maybe it's just me as well, a huge interest in German idealism. I mean, specifically around your work, which I find really, really interesting because, uh, like you go all the way back into shelling and, and in a way, I mean, not only you, you, you mean, like when I was looking at your work, I'll just say like, I could sit down with Matt and we can talk about Ken Wilbur, but you know, like the fact that we, I could sit down with you and we can go all the way back to shelling. Right. Yeah. And how you're doing that as well right now, uh, within the culture, you know, and, and bridging that in with whitehead and your work is having a massive impact. I mean, like guys like Matt McManus, which, you know, York University, all of a sudden they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we know him. <laughs> He's the shelling guy. And I'm like, <laughs> we're like, what the hell? Like, how is that even possible? Like, that these connections are that are happening all over the place, um, yeah. you know, and no, now your conversations with Verveke as well. I mean, so the Internet has come in and played a new hmm. a new role in all this, too. Um, but I, sure. I guess I guess this is. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, back to Michael, I mean, what people don't realize is that Michael's whole kind of background and philosophy is really, it, it, his bedrock is on integral theory and it is on Ken Wilber's work, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And that to me is, is, is amazing uh, to go out and watch uh, and how people are playing with that now moving forward within the culture. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so when you landed up at CIIS, who had a major impact on you there that, you know, you know, made you decide to go out and start focusing in on, on Whitehead and, and the German idealism? Uh, well, I think it's hard to say that um, each of the, the faculty who were there when I started the program haven't had a crucial role in sort of shaping my understanding of these things. But um, I was introduced well, I was introduced by uh, Terence McKenna to Whitehead, actually, and then Watts a little bit too, and didn't, but didn't read him and study him properly until my first year at CIIS with a professor named Eric Weiss, who, um, you know, was involved with uh, the Esalen um, conference uh, on theory, the Esalen um Center for Theory and Research, they called it, where they would uh, gather to talk about things like the postmortem survival of of uh, consciousness. And he was very interested in Whitehead and Sri Aurobindo. And so a lot of Eric Weiss's um, ideas, his approach was the synthesis of the two, Aurobindo's more um, sort of expansive Vedic sense of multiple levels of um reality beyond just the physical going into, you know, astral and, um, you know, uh, causal planes of, of, of existence and so on. But then Whitehead, who's much more rooted in the natural sciences and physics and, um, you know, more of an empiricist about 
how we should do cosmology and, and, uh, think about our experience. But, you know, Eric, Eric brought these two together. And so I took a course on Whitehead, uh, fall 2008 with him and, um, never looked back. I mean, I think I read adventures of ideas first and then, uh, took a stab at process and reality. Didn't get most of it the first time, a few moments of lucidity where I was like, okay, I need to understand the whole, this whole book because there's cl clearly something here. So probably read it, read it a dozen times at this point. And there are, there's still passages that I just am not sure. I'm not sure Alfred, <laughs> what you're trying <laughs> to say here, but uh, obviously, you know, I've continued to deepen every time I read it, I, my appreciation for this genius deepens. Um, and so uh, it's been, yeah, about 15 years since I've been studying Whitehead. Shelling came a little bit later, and um, it was in a course taught by Sean Kelly called uh, Hegel, Wilbur, and Moran, Edgar Moran, the French philosopher. Um, and the subtitle of that course was something like Complex Thinking and the Planetary Era or something like that. Okay. And uh, so I, we read... Um, mostly hegel in that course but in order to understand hegel you know you have to sp i spent i had already spent some time with kant but you know i had to spend more time with kant and then as to get to hegel you also have to you know this the usual story is like fichte and schelling are like the bridge between kant and hegel and you know the big thinkers are kant and, and hegel and you, but to understand hegel you have to cross the bridge but when i read schelling and you know i'm a, i really appreciate fichte too but um, when I read Schelling, I just felt like I was, uh, having my own mind mirrored for me on the page. Not that I had reached that level of clarity and in my articulation of, you know, the relationship between mind and nature and all the things that Schelling brilliantly discusses, but I just felt like, um, I, yeah, I recognized my own intuitions in, in his writing and, um, saw the resonances with Whitehead and I was like, wow, they're not usually compared. Like Whitehead's coming out of a totally different tradition in some sense. Um, like American pragmatism and British analytic philosophy, uh, and symbolic logic, like, and mathematics, like Whitehead's being born out of that. Whereas Schelling is coming out of this deep, uh, German romantic, um, uh, esoteric tradition really like going back to Meister Eckhart and Jakob Boma and these, these German mystics, um, in earlier centuries. And so Schelling, um, you know, obviously has this relationship with Hegel that, um, well, I shouldn't say obviously if for those who don't know, they, they, um, were roommates in, at seminary and good friends and collaborators for, um, many years until they had this break around 1806 or seven, um, where, you know, Hegel writes the phenomenology and Schelling is, um, offended by Hegel's characterization of, of his identity philosophy, as it was called then as the night in which all cows are black. And so there's, there's this antagonism between Hegelians and Schellingians usually. And, um, my, you know, then professor now colleague, uh, Sean Kelly, is more of a Hegelian. And so he and I uh, in a playful and like definitely mutually, um, enriching and, um, admiring way will like kind of challenge each other from, from, you know, taking on the personas of, uh, these two big thinkers and like trying to hash it out. Um, hopefully we'll teach a course together on, on, on these two philosophers at some point soon, but, um, yeah, but yeah, so that, those are, you know, Sean Kelly gave me, Schelling and uh, Eric Weiss gave me Whitehead for the first time in like a graduate academic so, context. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. No. I mean, because Sean Kelly's work actually, his even his book. I mean, dialogue. I mean, he edited the book in terms of dialogue right. with Ken Wilber. That's right. So I mean, that's how I originally got introduced to his work or to CIIS at that point. And uh, I guess cool. I could <laughs> mirror back to you some of the tensions that were going on there within. And they're interesting tensions even for me to, to go out and unpack. And I find a lot of people don't go really talk about because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the tension between humanistic 
psychology and the emergent transpersonal psychology and the feuds that were ha had there were uh, very fruitful dialogues and sort of intellectual battles, if you want to go out and call it right. Yeah. Who's pushing for a fourth way in psychology versus mm -hmm. the third way. And, uh, you know, people like Maslow obviously had a huge impact on me. Um, and then I got on to Rollo May and mm -hmm. I saw that Rollo May actually duked it out with Wilbur and Tillich okay, in the pages of that. humanistic psychology. Oh, they're pretty good papers if you go back and read that. Wow. Um, yeah, I will. Thanks for that. Uh, didn't know <laughs> and, about those. Yeah, no, and I, I like to, to think back to that because, I mean, the, the schism is really almost like an east-west divide, right? I mean, because mm -hmm. Rollo May and Tillich were, you know, well, obviously much more theologically grounded within Christianity. Um, and they're, I think mean, I wouldn't go out and say that, you know, they pushed back hard on, on Wilbur to be like, no, like you're, you're flying off the deep end here in terms of some of your stuff. And, you know, and, and then he eventually, he just kind of went his own way. And that's kind of how transpersonal psychology kind of popped out. And then even now, when I think back about, you know, like how transpersonal psychology took a bit of a hit, you know, around the eighties, mm. the early eighties into the mid eighties. And then eventually Wilbur start to articulate his own sort of integral philosophy right. at that point. Uh -huh. Um, and I mean, even for me, I mean, I have so much to thank for Wilbur, like, you know, like kind of like you, like I go back to that bibliography at the back of some of those books and you're like, shit, he read that. You know, like, you no, no, he's got, he's, <laughs> he's, he's got that in there as well. Um, <laughs> And even the tension, though, I mean, this is what I was talking to Jeremy about. Um, I'm happy that there was this tension between CIIS and Wilbur sort of as a lone scholar, because you guys have really, you've, there's an institution, there's a tradition there now that's, you know, that is, you know, it's much more grounded academically, you know, for people to point to or guys like me to go out and point to when I talk to other mm -hmm. people about, you know, integral theory or integral philosophy type idea, instead yeah. of just kind of pointing over to, you know, you know, this thing on the internet called integral life. <laughs> right. Um, and even that to me is, is an interesting thing as well, because I mean, my connection with Jeremy was, is really around that period was, you know, I guess, you know, walking into the financial crash of 2008, and some of the positions that they had taken, hmm. uh, you know, as an organization, you know, between the Integral Institute and eventually becoming Integral Life. Um, and it took on a very sort of corporate managerial business sort of flavor rather than going much more sort of academic -y. Not that, you know, I think academic is necessarily better, but uh, a rigorous sort of intellectual. There's uh, certainly less money in it. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess yeah, in a certain way. But this is why I'm I'm so excited to you know to to watch you come up and other guys too, like Sam Mickey. I mean, Sam Mickey's up at Yale now, if I understand correctly. Uh, he he does work with Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm yeah. um, at the Yale uh, Religion and Ecology uh, program, but um, he's teaching at the University of San Francisco. A nice Jesuit school. Oh, okay. um, yeah. So he's still, I, I was under the impression he had gone out to Yale and stuff like that. I didn't realize he still had. Uh... Unless, uh, unless my friend hasn't updated me, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but gotcha. uh, maybe, maybe, maybe he has. I'll <laughs> have to, yeah. I'll, I'll text him and get back to you. <laughs> okay. And I mean, Adam, uh, Adam Roberts as well. I mean, I see Adam him, Robert, quite, yeah. you know, like, and I, I know he did his PhD there and he kicked Doing off. Doing it as we it. speak, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, you know, and his side projects too, I mean, the, from the side view and, and Jeremy as well in terms of, mm -hmm. so, you know, like you guys are giving me a lot of hope that, you know, like mm -hmm. there is this other generation out there of, and even just for me of, of like-minded people that are still pushing that envelope, mm -hmm. um, you know, along with guys like um, that Michael, you know, so the, the point of my pod and, and the reason why I want to talk to you is, is just really to to flesh that out a bit and to get, you know, uh, get that out there that people can go out and turn to your work. Um, you know, if people are interested in the much more academically rigorous sort of, of reading of what integral theory could be. Um, mm -hmm. 
And I guess yeah. that would be kind of my next question to you. I mean, how do you relate to integral theory now? I mean, you know, like when you're talking to Verveke, it's not like you're breaking out the four quadrants. It's not like, you know, like when you're talking to some of these other guys yeah. uh, in terms of some of your interests. Uh, yeah. So you've ha you've developed sort of your own translation or ability to go out and communicate to people, you know, in terms of what's gone out and informed you and stuff like that. So mm. what? What's your relationship to it now and, and to, to, to Wilbur today, I guess, in terms of how you see the integral movement as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the question. Is it a whole or is it this sort of wildly branching, rhizomatic, you know, multi-pronged, uh, not lineage, but uh, yeah, rhizome, you know, in the sense that it's just so many people are influenced by it, but doing very different things with it. And I think, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly operating with a, what I would be perfectly happy to call an integral translation or a translation of what gets called integral philosophy in my own work, though I don't often brand myself, you know, that way. Because, I mean, that's the thing, right? With Integral Institute, there is this sense in which it became a bit of a brand and it's like, oh, well, if you're going to try to own that, then maybe I'll just do my own thing because um, you're doing it your way. And But there's clearly an integral um, nexus of, you know, resonant thinkers. And um, my relationship to that is just one of like deep appreciation. And, uh, you know, I don't know the extent to which my you know, it's tough to, to predict where my teaching and writing will go in the future. Um, right now, I'm, I've been deep in Whitehead, you know, and uh, at some days I feel like, wow, I'd really love to um, move on from this and like dump, jump into something totally different. And whether or not that will mean, you know, going deep into Sri Aurobindo and, and you know, trying to draw on his... Um, integral yoga in you know finding applications to uh, the planetary emergency which i think that's the broad context in which i hope all my thinking can find relevance um but yeah like in terms of the whether i'd go back to wilbur i mean probably not i think there's a lot of interesting work that um people like sean uh, esperon hargens and uh nick headland uh are doing to carry forward sort of meta integral theory that I think is what they're referring to it as. And I think one of their new books just came out. I think they're doing great work. And so that's like branching out of uh, the Wilbur that, I mean, the integral diaspora is a phrase I've heard on your podcast. I think <laughs> yeah. um, it's a good way of thinking of it. So, you know, in terms of like a qual and like the quadrants though, like, no, I don't, I, I don't find myself applying that as a methodology unless I'm in conversation with people who know it very well. And then it becomes a um, symbol system to um, convey dense meaning in a short amount of time, you know? So it's wonderful for that purpose, but it can very easily become an abstraction that um, obfuscates the underlying reality of a situation. Yeah. For example, yeah. class, where does class fit on the equal model? I don't see it anywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, we go out and just say it's the lower right, but you're right. No, no, in terms of class, how does that actually fit into to the lower right in terms of, you know, institutions? How you perceive the model itself. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so, I don't know. And it's that's not, no model's perfect. It's a powerful model, though. Yeah. And it helps us remember what that that it helps us rem remember what not to leave out yeah. we're always going to have individuals and collectives we're always going to have interiors and exteriors and if your account or your project you know your theory or your activity is leaving out any of these quadrants or pretending like one of them doesn't exist you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt others and you're going to make things worse for everyone right yeah so we don't want to leave any quadrant out but i think um, there's still so many mysteries about how the quadrants relate. And there's a lot of experimental and empirical research that remains to be done to understand how they relate. Yeah. And um, how levels relate, or if it even makes sense to refer to them as levels, if they're nested in holarchic, levels might not be a relevant category. 
anymore. Yeah. So, but yeah. I, I guess in terms of, because you draw a lot, or I mean, in terms of Evan Thompson, because of your background in cognitive sci, uh, is this something you've been able to go out and bridge with his crew, I guess, in terms of, like, in terms of, you know, because Evan and Verveke are kind of really in cahoots in terms of how they go out and view their model and uh, how they view the, the whole inactive turn. And I'm a huge fan of the, the inactive turn itself. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, Evan seems like he would be very conversant as well with integral theory, yet I've never really heard him talk about it publicly. I don't, I'm, I'm trying to remember if he has or not. I mean, he's given a talk or two over the last few years, maybe several years. I think it was a, the, the COVID time warp has skewed my memory. Maybe yeah. like five or six <laughs> years ago, he was at CIS to talk about his book, Waking Dreaming Being. And he's teaching in Berkeley like once a year now for their Buddhist studies department. So I run into Evan um, oh, cool. frequently. And uh, yeah, I mean, his work, his, I think major first major work. I mean, the, the embodied mind, but he co-authored that with Farella and Eleanor Roche. But the the uh, book he published in two thousand seven, Mind and Life, was so important for me. Right as I was starting graduate school, a year yes. later, okay. I didn't read his book until a year later, and um, the whole inactive approach to cognitive science and the autopoetic paradigm in theoretical biology. Um, super important for me and i've been thinking with those ideas since i read his book and the embodied mind before that so um wilbur obviously drank deeply from that that well as well and um i think uh i don't know what evan's opinion of integral theory is we'd have to have to ask him um i know he's very interested in whitehead now um I don't, I don't want to take all the credit for that. I'm sure he, he I know he knew his dad, William Irwin Thompson knew about Whitehead yeah, and wrote a thesis a on Whitehead. Well. And yeah. so Evan obviously already knew about Whitehead, but I've um, been trying to push him more in that direction for a while. And I think he's got a book coming out, uh, co-authored with a couple of physicists, maybe next year. I think it's with Cambridge um, or maybe it's MIT. Anyways, big university press that's called The Blind Spot. That's all about sort of a white heady intake on what uh, science, not as a method, but as a worldview leaves out. Gotcha. Um, so, um, yeah. So such important work. Yeah. No. And I mean, the, I mean, this is, I guess, cause when I was much more into Wilbur, I guess the, the lingo or the talking points was all around humanistic and transpersonal psychology mm -hmm. and then positive psychology popped out. Right. And then mm -hmm. now we have Cogsci. Not that Cogsci wasn't there in a certain way, but uh, Cogsci is just there in a huge way now in terms of oh, yeah. Cogsci, which was not, you know, when Wilbur was writing, not as prevalent or, you know, as present in the culture, I guess. No, but he was um, an early adopter for sure. Yeah. I mean, the footnotes in Sex, Ecology, and Spirituality on Varela's work too. are huge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Varela, they did have a massive impact across the board in terms of, uh, so, I mean, even that, I mean, cause, um, from what Jeremy told me, um, uh, Michael was big time into, uh, uh well, not Evan Thompson, but I mean, his father's work, mm -hmm. uh, it had a huge, huge impact on him. And apparently that's what they had a major connection there in terms of their, their particular interests. Um, and I mean, I mean, I'm just, I, I'm I like, because when I bumped into Jeremy, I mean, and we had our first conversation was actually the day that Michael died. Oh, wow. Mm. And like, I was, I mean, I still am very excited about all these things that are going on. But I mean, Michael just had a way of going out and weaving in the political that, I mean, it is lacking, I guess, in terms of some of, you know, some of this conversation. Um, you know, mm -hmm. like, I'd love to have you back on, just geek out on some of these larger sort of themes. But, um, I mean, I'd like to keep the focus just a bit on Michael, I guess, and around that, because, I mean, you guys were bouncing around, you know, and you were involved in some of these chats too, the idea of an integral left, right? you know, versus, uh, you know, whatever is going on on the right, if we want to call it the new right or the postmodern right, and what that would actually go and entail. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm super excited about that as well, because, 
uh, I guess for me personally, I mean, Michael was speaking, you know, to, I mean, I felt that alienation at one point or another. And when Peterson came on the scene and, you know, I'm seeing, you know, even guys like, uh, you know, David Fuller that got very attracted to Peterson's work, you know, and now all of a sudden we're seeing this, you know, people are having these huge regrets of, you know, all, all of a sudden we propped up this one guy and it's turned out to be a bit of a nightmare. Um, and what does this actually go out and mean for the culture? Um, so I, I guess in terms of your political orientation for you too, it seems to have been something that's resonated with you as well, that, you know, in terms of your natural, I guess, political uh, preference, I guess, is, is to the left or to the to progressive side. So, you know, how are you feeling, I guess, from on a political front right, these days in terms of, you know, we're seeing all this stuff going on in the culture, but, you know, kind of where are you at politically in terms of you feel things might go? You know, I was so stunned. Um, I don't want to say traumatized because that seems a little bit overblown and I don't think it's anything close to what the sorts of trauma that some people suffer. But uh, when, when Bernie lost again in 2020, after the initial like sense in the first few primaries, you know, before South Carolina when the whole establishment went behind Biden, it seemed like, oh, wow, we might actually have a chance. The country really wants this. This could work as an antidote to Trumpism, like left wing populism instead of right wing populism. And it's like, okay, here we go. And then just to have that, you know, first Corona and then to have Bernie just shut down so hard. I actually don't even remember which order. Maybe Bernie was first getting, uh, you know, losing in South Carolina and then kind of falling in line behind Biden. Um, it just deflated me so much politically in terms, because I was really involved in the both Sanders campaigns in a way that I had never been before um, okay. in wow. any political campaign and um, just felt like, okay, this is like America's last chance. I could see it already at the, the end of Obama's second term, like McConnell blocking the Supreme Court nominee, all these things. There's like, we're headed for something dark unless we do what Obama had the promise of doing, but, you know, turned out to be mostly image and, and less substance. And so I threw everything into the Bernie campaign and was canvassing and making calls and learned a lot about how incoherent most Americans' political opinions really are just on the phone with them. And it's not, it's not the way the corporate media portrays it at all. You know, most yeah. people's feelings about stuff, um, and understanding about the issues. There's very, most people don't have time to read the news, to, to, to know the issues. Um, maybe they watch five minutes of a cable news show and like that forms their opinion. And it's like, oh, that's dangerous, right? So anyways, I'm, I've been a bit um, politically lost, not in the sense that I don't have values and firm convictions and ideas about how society might function better, yeah. but because I don't see any um, viable political options in the current constitutional order. Um, I don't have any patience anymore for this, like lesser of two evils. You got to support the Democrats because the Republicans are becoming so fascist arguments because the Democrats have had power for two years. And I know like they have two Senate senators who are whatever, but it's not the Democrats are enablers, and to the extent that they are empowered, they will just enable this deep. I think it's a wound ultimately on the right to fester. Yeah, and uh, the longer that wound festers, there's a real pain and suffering there among the white working class and the working class across the board, actually, which yeah. is why people of color. Latinos in particular are all of a sudden becoming more right wing and, and supported Trump in the second, his second uh, election. So there's a, there's a real like deep pain in the working class that, yeah, still mostly white, but increasingly not just white. Yeah. That's going to go more right wing unless uh, there's another option politically and it's not going to come from the Democrats. They've made it absolutely clear, clear. Yeah, that yeah. they're not going to give a fuck about the working class at all. And so where do we turn? I don't know. There's, there's very little chance for third parties to have equal access to 
I mean, I guess with the debate, the debate commission that existed has been blown up. So it'll be interesting to see what happened because the Republic, the GOP said, we won't participate anymore with mm -hmm. the existing, you know, corporate media controlled debate agency or whatever it is. Right. So I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe it'll be more open and um, we'll get viable third party candidates who will come in there. But there's the libertarians will, will have their voice and like, what's the, where's the voice on the left? Bernie's too old. Yeah. AOC's not ready to do that yet in terms of, I mean, you need, you need to have some gray hairs to run for president. I'm sorry. You know, whether yeah. you're a man or a woman, <laughs> you need to have some gray hairs. Gotcha. So, yeah, yeah. uh, and I know working in Washington, she'll have some soon, but I don't think she's quite there yet. Yeah. But, so where, mean, where, how, do, but how do you, would you self-identify as a socialist? Would you? I, don't know. It depends who I'm talking to. Yeah. Okay. Um, what socialism can mean a lot of things. And I, so I, I would have to clarify and say, I do think that markets, I do think the economy should have some degree of autonomy from the state. Yeah. I do not believe that command and control economies work in terms of actually providing uh, equitable distribution of goods and services. They just don't work. Yeah. Capitalism doesn't work in that sense either but i think there are political reasons for that in terms of how power is distributed in our society and so the state has a role in protecting people's rights including labor rights workers rights including environmental rights but the state should not be regulating and micromanaging or really managing much at all the economy beyond just enforcing rights and protection of workers and the environment and so on but um so in that sense, you know, yeah, I guess I'm not a socialist because I don't think that the, I don't believe that workers should have a, um, dictatorship over yeah. control of the means of production. Um, well, I think I mean, there's a role for entrepreneurship, thing, but I mean, as North Americans, I mean, I'm Canadian. I mean, yeah, like not that we, we have, you know, social democratic party up in Canada, but I mean, the, the, the label in terms of socialism, I mean, it's, it's got a lot of baggage for a lot of people. And, you know, I, I'm thinking even in terms of, you know, our connection here in terms of, you know, what integral theory is. I mean, because if, like you said, I mean, you know, Whitehead did go and crisscross a lot of different other philosophies, particularly pragmatism. And pragmatism mm -hmm. is in, there's, there is almost a left wing sort of pragmatism, uh, mm -hmm. you know, school. I mean, Dewey in terms of his overall philosophy and you know, and who he was as, as an individual. I mean, not only writing about education, but writing about democracy and the sort of vision that he had. I mean, mm -hmm. so powerful. If, if socialism means democratic socialism as a political yeah. movement, totally, I'm fully behind it. I mean, I supported Bernie, right? Yeah, and so exactly. I know yeah. he was running as a Democrat, but democratic socialism is not state control of the means of production. It's just not. It's yeah. just, it's what every other almost every other democ functioning democracy in the world does. Yeah. Right. Basic welfare, Yeah, you know, which is in our own constitution. So I'm not quite sure why everyone pretends like it's not indigenously American. I mean, I don't mean that in the, like, obviously Native Americans have indigeneity in a way that none of the white people here do, but in terms of being constitutional and embedded in the founder's vision, yeah. taking care of the welfare of people is right there. It's right there. Yeah. And we've, for whatever reason, been hoodwinked by this laissez-faire like everyone's a temporarily embarrassed millionaire idea yeah no i mean it, it is i mean because i mean the other person that i was always amazed with uh with michael is that he was always talking to cornell west and yeah. cornell's west as as an intellectual as well public intellectual his background is so complex and his links to pragmatism to me is I mean, it's so not talked about. I mean, <laughs> his book on it is great. The evasion of Mer American philosophy. Yes. Yeah, it's it's a good. Yes, book. Yeah. Um, and that has deep roots as well within kind of the, I mean, if you want to go and call it integral thinking, I mean, some people, I mean, I've been quite touched by, um, uh, I, oh my God, I'm blanking out on his name. Uh, the writer in terms of, uh, on education. Zach Stein. Is it Zach Stein? Yeah. yeah. I mean, Zach draws a, a direct lineage to Wilbur that I guess, you know, in terms of out of pragmatism. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I wonder why, you know, at times, I mean, we're not necessarily more organized and more vocal that there is mm -hmm. some sort of, you know, left, left leaning version of that, mm -hmm. that, uh, 
that is just as powerful, I would think, you know, in terms of just kind of going out and focusing or, you know, hovering around, you know, organizations like Jacobin or online publications and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, I mean, honestly, I think uh, I'm at a place now and I don't know that I'll always stay here as conditions on the ground evolve, but I'm at a place now where left and right as categories just make less and less sense to me. Yeah. Because there's so many ways of being left now that I that are irreconcilable. Like I mean the there's the the left which focuses almost all of its energy on um issues of identity yeah. and culture. And then there's the left that focuses or strives to focus its attention on material conditions. Yeah. Um economic and, and, and legal issues that are beyond just how one identifies, but rather in terms of, um, you know, economic justice issues. And um, remembering that uh, I think, yeah, we've passed the point in this country where the majority of working class people are not white, right? So um, that split on the left has really frustrated me forever. And yeah. Um, I think it's the main reason that the Nazis came to power and it's the main reason that that might happen again in America today because yeah. we can't form the sorts of um, solidarity that the right seems capable of. Um, and so until, not that the left should fall in line, I mean, we're characterologically um, resistant to falling in line. I mean, that's one of the the values that progressives and left-wing people tend to, to <laughs> adhere to is the sense that like, in a way it's this not Revolution. economic liberty. <laughs> yeah. Radical. It's not economic. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not economic libertarianism, but it's definitely the value of liberty as an individual to like, not have to, um, you know, an valuing argument, valuing debate, valuing these and like being open to changing your mind. Like, that creates this turmoil on the left that I think on the right, where there's more of this sense of like, we have the traditional values that have always worked and all we have to do is protect them. You know, you don't need to create something new. It's like, we have it already. Yeah. I think, and I'm, this is like a very simplified caricature of left and right, but you know, so I guess I'm just questioning the extent to which even my own caricature here is valuable to us in this moment, because um, we need to think beyond a binary yeah, I think in higher dimensional space politically, like you know, one way I've been interested in social ecology or what's sometimes called libertarian socialism, um, which comes out of the work of Murray Bookchin, and really is breaking down and and totally scrambling our existing political categories, right? And I think again, most Americans, when you ask them about the issues and their opinions. They're all over the map in terms of what they think about each issue, whether it's you know stereotypically a left or right wing, a conservative or progressive position. Most people don't always only highly educated people, which is twenty percent of maybe twenty percent, fifteen percent of the population, has a political ideology. I think most yeah. people are, you know, it's it it depends on the issue what they what they think if they think about the issues at all, because again, most of them, they're working, they're not, you know. So we have these divisions in society and I'm not sure left and right adequately captures what's going on nowadays in the way that it might have, you know, in the late 1700s when the constitution was written. Yeah. Um, and so we really need to be more imaginative, I think. And I not, I'm not claiming to have the right language to talk about these things, but I don't know that the divisions as we construe them as left versus right, the real divisions in society don't line up with that um, binary, I don't yeah. think. No, well, I mean, because they seem to be changing as well all the time, right? I mean, yeah. it's this, I mean, this is the other thing too, is that, I mean, the idea of what an integral left would actually go and look like, or even, you know, obviously people are playing around with the idea of metamodernism as well, right? That somehow that will somehow get out of this 
this confusing time in terms of, you know, our postmodern age, in terms of whatever yeah. the hell that means. So it kind of fits in within the kind of integral mold of things. But you're right. I mean, for a lot of people that too, I mean, you know, like if we're going to go and start talking about some sort of, you know, pre-modern left and right, some modern left and right, and then we have a postmodern left and right, you know, it would only make sense. I mean, to me anyway, in, in a certain way that, you know, whatever is going to come afterwards, whether it be integral or metamodern, there's mm-hmm. going to be some left and right again and we're still going to be duking it out <laughs> in yeah. terms of how that looks and how we go and organize ourselves and stuff like that um perhaps yeah that that may be true um but it's changing all the time right so yeah what was exactly. left 200 years ago is not necessarily left now and i guess i just get you know, and then in the, in the the American media, you know, like the New York Times will refer to people like AOC or Bernie as very liberal, when I think they're challenging key aspects of lib- liberalism in the classical sense. And so it's like, the terminology here is just, I don't know, hard to track sometimes, and yeah. uh, makes it difficult to communicate. But you know, here's here's what I would say, the evolution of my political position was like, Bernie tapped into my sense of an alternative America that's just as American, and when you look at our history and the movements that have been birthed here, as what Trump claims to be, the the you know honoring the legacy of an America, which is the darker yeah. side, I think, um, the, you know, the Confederate side of things and the um, big business side of things, and uh, but Bernie represented this part of America that I want to be proud of that hasn't really had its chance to shine. And when he, when he was, when he lost twice, I realized, okay, maybe I have to let go of that dream of America. Maybe that's not in the cards. Right. And so now I'm rather than thinking that we could somehow salvage the existing constitutional order, rather than thinking the governing institutions, the Supreme court, the executive and the, uh, legislative branches could continue to function with any degree of legitimacy. Mm-hmm. I think the best case scenario at this point is that power devolves to the states and the federal government withers away and dies. And that will mean a great deal of suffering for people who, you know, might live in states that are, that where they're a minority. Yeah. And there will be a great deal of migration and there and, and, and suffering, but it might be less suffering than the alternative, which is a civil war a battle for control of a governance system that was not designed to govern 380 million people or whatever the population is now it's it's the federal system was not supposed to grow so large and Mm -hmm. this sounds like something conservatives say right so (laughs) on some level um i'm not opposed to that libertarian sense in which institutions operating at such a scale inevitably harm individuals and even particular communities because they have such blunt instruments that they're wielding across such vast differences of of culture and and values right and so the the idea of states having more power while initially seems seems frightening for people if you're a progressive frightening for people in mississippi and alabama and texas and florida but um I think we need to move in a more pluralist direction, truly pluralistic direction, where we accept that, um, you know, this striving after a universal sense of human rights was always a more local, even parochial, like liberal fantasy that works for some people who are more or less disembedded from family and local community who've gone to school and learned this cosmopolitan way of being an international citizen or whatever, for that small percentage of the population, you know, you can think in this way about what's universal, but it's not actually universal. It's highly constructed and unique to a very specific lineage of Western European political thought. <laughs> yeah. And so we need to let go of the idea that liberal democracy and capitalism are somehow the best for all humans. Yeah. No, for sure. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, even, but even Michael Burke's idea of what cosmopolitanism is, 
right? He seems to be using an integral frame in terms of what that would look like. I mean, he went with socialism. I mean, he, talking to Jeremy, he said that he's like, you know, he would have loved to see him start talking about some sort of integral cosmopolitanism. Or cosmolocalism, um, I think. Yeah, is, exactly. Or, some yeah. of the, the lingo that they've been playing around with. Because, I mean, you're right. I mean, people feel they don't... Um, they don't feel like they have roots in a certain way. I mean, and technology is definitely going out and pulling, you know, people's feet, you know, pulling the rug un underneath people's feet all of a sudden where you're just living your life online. Yeah. And all of a sudden you don't have a sense of rootedness. Um, so I, I feel you on the, uh, the idea as well of trying to go out and tap into some sort of lineage or tradition within the American sort of ethos. And it's so broad. And I mean, you're already tapping into a huge one. I mean, in terms of, well, you're, I mean, I guess this is, in terms of how you're viewing German idealism being mm -hmm. transplanted within the American context and being picked up by some, you know, by pragmatism and stuff like that. I mean, is that how you're viewing it now, I guess, in a certain way? Because, I mean, there's this big excitement all of a sudden around German idealism moving into the Anglosphere. Mm. There seems to be a lot of excitement all of a sudden. Oh, about yeah. bringing that in and, 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 you know, how does it make sense with who we are as North Americans in a certain way? Well, if you think back to, you know, the founding of the American intellectual tradition and thinkers like Emerson, yeah, um, you know, the dial, the transcendentalist journal that, uh, you know, he and others started was the first English translator of, uh, in America of, um, Schelling, yeah. uh, and uh, Coleridge was first over in in the UK, but he mostly plagiarized, didn't attribute it to Shelley. Yeah, but when I he learned that from you. I remember hearing you talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, and I should say, <laughs> Schelling, Schelling forgave Coleridge for this. He was just so appreciative of being so deeply understood um, by an English speaker that uh, he let the plagiarism slide. Oh, uh, um, okay. And he borrowed one of Coleridge's words, uh, tautagorical. Uh, Schelling did in his late uh, lectures on philosophy of mythology. But anyways, uh, yeah, the transplantation of German idealism to America is definitely um, part of what has shaped me philosophically. Dewey had, you know, was a deep appreciator and, and studied Hegel like um, very closely when he was a student in Germany. And like, um, you know, James was, though critical of much of that idealist tradition, deeply conversant in it, and and, and in the end appreciative, especially when he was on nitrous oxide. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think the what what the American absorption of this idealist um, continental mode of thought did is is yeah make it more world focused and. And in a way, um, open it from any temptation at closure of system. Open it in the sense that um, the need for ongoing democratic processes of negotiation, not just at the human level, but at the you know biological and ontological levels, like to think of reality itself in Whitehead's terms as a democracy of fellow creatures. Mm. I think is uh, kind of, I know Whitehead's British, but he did his philosophy in, in America at Harvard where the Emersonian and Jamesian lineage was alive and well. And he was self-consciously again, drinking from that well. So um, a democracy of fellow creatures. Yeah. That's like what happens when you take this grand idealistic vision of God's participation in the world and you Americanize it, you make it democratic and pluralistic. Um, such that like where do you find god not up there in heaven but in each creature yeah yeah every other human being you find god within every other human being but in every every species right and in stars and galaxies and i was a little late joining today because i was itching to see this first image from james webb that's released it it was released right at 2 p.m pacific okay i got to see it it's cool i need to look more closely but uh you know, every galaxy is like God incarnate and like God takes on all these different forms. Um, and so like, how does the left integrate spirituality by like recognizing that its own ethical impulse is to take care of other people in the earth? That's a religious motivation and you need to understand the source of it. 
Yeah. And no, and, 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 yeah. and the left were not doing very well on terms of uh, bridging in uh, religion or spirituality in a certain way. I, don't I mean, think there's so. an element, there's a tradition that's there, I guess you could go and say, yeah. you know, that, uh, but I mean, it's, it's not as strong right now uh, compared to the right. I mean, the right has managed to go and you really co-opt the idea of what religion is in a certain way, which is sad, uh, but we, we got a lot of work to go and do on that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. That's where you want to talk about the new left. Yeah. If it's if it's going to be uh, capable of acting with power to yeah. confront the power that's building on the right, it's going to need to engage with these these religious dimensions of the human psyche is one way to put it, or these you know ultimately spiritual dimensions of the universe of of our existence in this universe like there's clearly more to history than material conditions oh no, no. That yeah, yeah i mean and this is why guys like peterson as well right and he's tapping into meaning and spirituality which i mean we definitely need to go and then just and integrate like, whim, whim, totally whim. even if just from a pragmatic point of view yeah. if you want people to become conscious of uh, and of the sorts of values you know that progressives are putting forward you're going to need to tap into religious impulses yeah and like it is it is um terrifying to me to see what the fascist right is doing with christianity yeah um obviously there are examples of christianity and various churches being extremely violent um in the past and power hungry and all these things, but and depressive. But I think uh, at the heart of that religion is, is a, is a powerful transformative message and vision. And um, I don't of know love. that it makes sense for the left. <laughs> it's supposed to be what, a powerful message of love, of, of love. And, but I <laughs> don't think it makes sense. Yeah. For the you left know, like, to cede that to the yeah. right. Don't yeah. seed that. that like, exactly. Yeah. Do what Cornell West does. Yeah. You know. <laughs> no, for sure. No, no, that part is uh, definitely. I mean, needs to be. I mean, and this is the interesting thing too about guys like Michael Brooks. I mean, he was talking to Cornell West. He was talking about ideas of Buddhism on the left. So he was, you know, not. He was not scared to go and broach those yeah. questions of meaning and spirituality and weaving that in. And you um, can totally be an atheist in the name of God. You know, yeah. so you, it's not like you have to believe in a faith if just to acknowledge that love is love is divine. And yeah. it has, you know, I love what Cornell says, Cornell West says that love, uh, justice is what love looks like in public. Yeah. Beautiful. You know? Yeah. So yeah. we have to tap into these impulses. Yeah. No, and I press Ben Burgess out of all of them because Burgess... <laughs> He's a bit of a logic bro on, up on the left, and uh, he uh, <laughs> logos he would, man. He, it's important too. <laughs> he would go toe to toe, and he'd butt butt heads with Michael. But um, when I had him on the pod, I mean, the amazing thing was is that he's like, what people don't realize is that my wife is religious. Like, well, why are you guys haggling me <laughs> about? You know, like you know, like I'm not. You know, it doesn't really go and do much for me. But I mean, and I was amazed to go and hear that story for him. I'm like, man, you should be leading with that. Don't lead. Don't you know put your wife up there let her preach about it <laughs> yeah <laughs> there you go that's right so th there's that part but i mean i'd love to, to to circle back around with you because uh i'm gonna be sitting down with uh christopher uh satur and to oh, go cool. and talk about german idealism and nice. i'm fascinated with you know what's happening in north america with german idealism particularly stuff around the uh the, uh, the new society of uh shelling society that's run yep. by Sean McGrath and Jason, I can't remember. Worth. Worth, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah. fairly new. So, because I've always felt that there was, I mean, I'm from Canada. So obviously Charles Taylor's, you know, our, our guiding light, but he's a Hegelian. Right, so, right. And all of a sudden I'm seeing this sort of Hegelians kind of pop up all over the place now and yep. willing to go and challenge these Hegelians in a very fruitful and, uh, interesting way um yeah well you know i mean hegel is so uh deep in his analysis of human social process yeah and it's still very valuable you know in, when we're trying to study the nature of like um 
sociality. Shelling is way more focused on nature. Yeah. And I think um, in some, and on God and on religion and myth and stuff, Hegel was more interested in sort of getting through religion as a mode of consciousness or shape of consciousness, as he would put it from, you know, like the symbolic and mythic to law and, you know, um, politics and the social in a secular sense, which he thought, yeah, required religion as a, um, a moment in its own self-development. But once you get to reason, you don't need religion anymore. Whereas Schelling was like, no, we still need religion and myth. And also reason in the mind is the flower of nature or the fruit of nature, if you want. And so if we forget our roots, if we think that spirit floats above the earth, like some sort of disembodied, disincarnate, pure intellectual uh, uh, ghost, then we're going to be not only confused, but um, we're going to destroy the world. <laughs> yeah. You know, so Schelling's very much trying to return our attention to nature, not nature as just a collection of objects to be measured and weighed by the scientific apparatus, but nature as a living organism. And we as human beings, as um, the uh, kind of the, the zero point of that organism, like that, we, the human is the mind of nature. Right. And so it's not like Schelling's, he's definitely anthropocentric, but it's an anthropocentrism that doesn't think of the human as separate from the universe that generates the human. So it's a, it's integral in that sense. Right. Yeah. Um, and so Schelling, I think is experiencing this resurgence in the English speaking world because he's, his solutions are, um, solutions to the problems that we face even more um, obviously today than we did in the early 1800s, the late 1700s when he was writing. So, you know, the ecological crisis has kind of forced the issue and required us to rethink who we are as human beings, what our relationship is to the earth, and um, and also to, to reconsider even in a secular rational age uh, to reconsider the meaning of religion and myth and um, spirituality to recognize that um, you can't really have one without the other. You can't have rationality and science unless you also have this deep relationship to the numinous, to the spiritual, and a spiritual that's fully imminent and not off somewhere else, right? But like, no, like, Schelling is such an aesthetic thinker so his concepts often take sensuous form right and he has this whole philosophy of art that's beautiful and that for him the you know the be beauty is the infinite and finite form and that our experience of nature is sublime and that that the sublimity of nature as we experience it through our senses and as we reflect upon it and we're and and grasp <laughs> we grasp that we can't fully grasp the the creativity of nature and that has philosophical implications um you know so Schelling yeah I mean I could rap on Schelling forever and um I'm well, so excited perfect. to hear you have Chris coming on <laughs> yeah he I mean can do Chris it even better than me <laughs> I mean Chris has been a whole education on itself I mean I'm part yeah. of his discord there so um and he's just really opened up for me the I guess a sort of uh Canadian tradition of of Schelling you know nice. all the way back to Watson which I had no mm. idea. So, I mean, even in terms of the British idealist, I mean, my, you know, I am just not very conversant in that. So, you know, I've been picking up on trails there as well. And, and very interested, I guess, in terms of how the kind of Canadian ethos has been communicating with the American sort of tradition as well, when it comes to mm. this. Uh, nice. So McGrath has, I mean, discovering McGrath's worth out, in, you know, uh, out, uh, out East, I mean, has been a real gift for me to go out and see, uh, his work, I mean, his, his work is amazing. And the yeah. fact that he's in cahoots with Jason yeah. is kick-ass. <laughs> it is kick-ass. Yeah. yeah. Um, like that I'm, to me I, is, and from my understanding is that Jason is is fully conversant with kind of what we're talking about in terms of integral theory and, and uh -huh. Wilbur's work. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, and I'm, you know, and even uh, Sam Mickey, I mean, because his stuff in terms of the the religion and ecology speaks to me mm-hmm. deeply on that front. So, oh yeah, I know Sam's very familiar and, and appreciative of Wilbur's work. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, all these dimensions are coming into uh, to the conversation, and I'm hoping to keep that going as well. And they keep, I mean, Michael's kind of uh, voice alive in all this as well. Uh, because, uh, you know, through some of the people that I've been talking to, I mean, Chris is very good friends with the guys from the pill pod and McManus is part of that crew. Oh, right. And yeah. they were very good friends with, uh, with Michael, right. Through mm-hmm. Ben Burgess and stuff like that. And yet this dimension of Michael's life, this rich philosophical sort of, uh, tradition that we're talking about has been left off the table. So to me, mm. to be able to to tap on you, Jeremy and Sam, and some of these other guys to to to, to you know to cut pipe up and possibly duke it out with some of these guys is going to be fun. Yeah, <laughs> fun to watch. Glad you're and keeping to, and, the and 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 to, flame alive. to to entertain. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, oh, I I'd, I'd love to do some kind of dialogue format. Yeah, um, you know, we could be playful and frame it as a debate, but that would just be playful for me. I'm not trying to. Yeah. Like, win no, any no, arguments sure. here because ben would probably kick my ass <laughs> <laughs> logic bro uh <laughs> but i mean either that in terms of how this falls over within the marxist tradition as well i mean like mm-hmm. I'm, you know like i was very familiar with eric Fromm, so for you know and that's in critical theory as well to a certain extent uh through some professors that i had up at concordia yeah um, because they were much more, I mean, two of my professors were knee deep in Habermas. So that's what I got right. hit over the head once I landed there. <laughs> Good. And I should clarify, I'm not anti-Marxist too. I know I was saying I'm not a socialist earlier, but I have no, exactly, really yeah. appreciated Marxist thought. And yeah, um, I just don't think, I think his critiques are fantastic and his prescriptions are catastrophic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's basically no. what I think. No, no, for sure. And I mean, with your background in German idealism, I know, like that's not too far around the corner for you to 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 to, to bring out and start mm-hmm. uh, talking about as well. Yeah. But I mean, this is what I mean, like watching you guys all out there doing this, right? I mean, you guys are, I mean, you guys are fresh PhDs. You guys are a new generation coming up there, uh, dialoguing with you know guys like Verveki too about some of the stuff, and even Evan, Evan Thompson, which are a bit older, right? I mean, they're oh yeah, they're they're an older kind of Gen X sort of. I mean, I'm actually young gen x i'm right on the cusp okay. so i self-identify much more as a millennial uh nice what year were you born 77 77 okay yeah yeah i'm so, 86 yeah cool no well, <laughs> properly millennial yeah <laughs> yeah but i mean uh well yeah michael was 83 i think okay. so in terms of where he fit on that cusp as well mm-hmm. uh and I mean, when I think about guys like Peterson and some of these older guys, I mean, I'm ashamed to say that I'm a Gen X. If this is what we're doing, it's like, what the fuck, guys? Like, yeah. So, I mean, Verveki to me is a, is a, you know, uh, is is hope. I mean, I see some hope there. I see Evan Thomas as, as hope. I mean, I, I see a lot yeah, of hope likewise. Out there. So, uh, and just to see young guys like you guys coming up through the ranks and, you know, taking institutional roots as well uh i mean hats off i mean keep up the great work thanks eric and likewise um <laughs> glad you're keeping the flame the candle alive and yeah. uh yeah let's uh, add logs to the fire so yeah and keep it going keep Super. me in the loop and uh, yeah. i'll enjoy watching all your future episodes as uh like if you're you're gonna have sam mickey it sounds like and i'd love uh, to Chris yeah. Sator. if you need help getting in touch with sam let me know i, I think he'd enjoy a conversation with you about these topics and more cool. so yeah Perfect. All right. Well, I mean, I won't keep you any longer. I mean, this has been a lot of fun and Mm -hmm. uh, I'll definitely probably come knocking around again. (laughs) Look forward to it. (laughs) All right, bud.